Does it taste like honey when the first time you made it? When my co-founder Aaron Schaller made the first prototype, uh, it tasted, uh, I'd say interestingly, it, tasted, it was an interesting <laughs> taste. Hey everyone, this is Rick and welcome back to The Seed, The Startup Journey, the entrepreneurship podcast sharing the urgent stories of amazing founders and the companies in under 20 minutes. Today we'll be chatting with the founder of Melibao, Darko Mandic. Darko is working on something super cool. He is making honey without bees. Not only is honey not vegan friendly, current beekeeping practices is also harming the biodiversity of bees. In order to solve this, Darko is creating honey, actual honey without any bees in the process. A quick note, because of some technical difficulties, Darko's audio in the first minute of this episode will be slightly muffled. So please bear with me, I promise you it will get better. And let's jump right in. Hey Darko, thank you so much for coming onto our podcast today. When I first came across your post on LinkedIn, I was like, okay, I gotta reach out to you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself as well as how you're making honey without bees? Thanks for having me, Rick, on your podcast. And I'm happy that you reached out because I always like to interact with people that really care about what Mali Bio is doing and how we are creating a better future for humans and a better future for bees. So basically, um, as a short introduction, we're the world's first company to develop a technology and produce real honey without bees. And we are doing this because of sustainability and also because we believe that honey is one of the most amazing products that ever existed, but since it's not coming in plant-based and vegan option, it misses a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. So how did you and why did you come up with this idea? Because I know you're a vegan. Was it because you missed the taste of honey? I came across bees in uh, 2012 when I, joined the in when I joined the honey industry, but I joined the industry that was selling honey coming from the bees. But I didn't know nuances. I didn't know that there are other bees besides honeybees and that actually the honey production is one of the most dam damaging things to wild and native bee species. And when I realized that after a lot of years, I, I decided to turn vegan and I also decided to turn vegan because of my own health as well. So that, that, that was one exciting journey and one of the best decisions that I made in my life. Yeah. So after you came up with this idea, what was the next step? Because like I could say right now, oh, I want to make eggs without chicken, but I would have no idea how to get started. So how did you take that first step? Uh, the idea of making honey without bees was actually the idea of uh, reinventing myself and taking something new that I learned, but still coupling it with the previous experience I had. So when I realized how damaging my industry was, I either had two options to leave the industry and find other industry or to make my industry better. And I decided to do the later part. You know, looking into honey, it's really amazing, inspiring product. And in terms of what we are thinking at Mali Bio's next product, we're really obsessed with honey because there are more than 300 main types of honeys. And um, we want to be able as the leading company of the future honey industry, we want to be able to produce all of them. Can you tell me a little bit more about like, you know, the first prototype? Does it taste like honey when the first time you made it? When my co-founder Aaron Schaller made the first prototype, uh, it tasted, uh, I'd say interestingly, it, tasted, it was an interesting <laughs> taste, but that wasn't something that both of us would say it's like honey, but it was a great thing to start with because our initial prototypes were really good at, at the color and the texture. But I'm happy to say that after many iterations, our latest prototype really tastes like a delicious honey. And uh, we're really proud of that because uh, we've put a lot of uh, um, sweat and tears into that. And uh, I'm happy to see that we are progressing towards producing the most delicious honey that ever existed. What's the number of your latest prototype? Like how many iterations have you gone through? I would say that we had, um, in terms of like main iterations, probably something close to 15. Right. And then every single of those iterations had some kind of uh, slight changes. I would say we are not there yet because we have high standards. We don't mm -hmm. want our honey to taste as the best tasting vegan honey. We want our honey to taste as the most delicious honey ever. 
So um, we are still tweaking uh, the prototypes and working on getting the best uh, version out there in the market as our first product. I imagine there are probably also some downsides to this, right? Like maybe your honey is more expensive to produce or maybe it doesn't have as much of the health benefits. Like what's the catch or what's the biggest challenge right now? Uh, I would say there's no catch. We want to make honey as bees make it to taste delicious, to uh, be an amazing superfood that's nutrition. So we want to produce the same product just without the bees. But definitely one of the hurdles that will be out there is definitely the pricing that won't be as perfect uh, with the first version as we plan for that to be in the future with bigger volumes and with production in place at a large scale. So our first product will be really delicious and nutritious, but with our subsequent versions, there will definitely be improvements as it's always with new products. But what we'll be focusing on is also the pricing, which needs to go down as we scale. When are you planning on launching this first product? So the first product is set to be launched towards the end of this year in the United States. It will be a soft launch with limited volumes, but we'll be happy to put our first version out there in the market. It will be a one year and six or eight months of extensive R&D work. And we are excited to learn what people think about it. Yeah, I'm excited to hopefully try it out sometime too. Um, so, Doctor, I know that you went through uh, Big Idea Ventures, which is a VC fund and accelerator. Um, for some of my audience who aren't very familiar with accelerators, could you share with us your experience there and maybe you know whether or not it helped to accelerate your business? Thank you for that question. And I love talking about Big Idea Ventures, not only because they're the accelerator program that we've gone through and that Big Idea Venture is our leading investor, but I need to say that Big Idea Ventures is an amazing and a passionate group of people that is really changing the world by supporting the best entrepreneurs in their biggest ideas around food and alternative protein space. Uh, having offices in Singapore, New York, and I think Paris is coming up soon. Big Idea Ventures is probably the best team out there that can help any alternative protein startups to uh, develop, uh, evolve, and scale. We've learned a lot through their program. We connected with many mentors coming from scientific and business worlds, and Big Idea Ventures helped us to progress with our R&D, progress in developing our company and later on uh, raise our pre-seed round at $850,000. I would say that thanks to Big Idea Ventures, we are today much uh, more developed startup than we were when we uh, met them at the first time. Yeah, and you mentioned that you raised $850,000 for your pre-seed round. Congrats on that, by the way. How are you planning on using that money to you know, grow your business? We are already using that money to uh, attract more people to work together with us in launching our first product. So next to uh, my co-founder, myself, and, and uh, two official advisors and a couple of uh, unofficial advisors, we also um, introduced a few of the new team members that are helping us in uh, different part-time and consultancy capacities. We are working with the best food scientists. We are working with the best process engineers um, uh, that are helping us to launch our first product. So majority of the funds are directed towards uh, collecting more resources through having more experts working together with us on launching the, the first product. That's awesome. And Dr. One question that I wanted to also ask is um, because a lot of times when I interview you know, all these successful entrepreneurs, uh, they seem like they accomplished so much, but there's always this hidden layer behind it of like failures, right? Like, you know, they have to go through a lot of challenges and sometimes they have setbacks that even make them want to kind of give up. So I was wondering if you also have some sort of experience uh, that you could share with us similar to that. Definitely, Rick. It's really important for all of us to talk about failures because more often we give an opportunity for many successes to be shared and sometimes when you're an entrepreneur at your beginning of your journey, sometimes you feel that everybody around you is succeeding. Everybody is sharing amazing posts about raising money, launching products. Um, and 
that that approach is not perfect because we really need to be open about sharing about our failures. In terms of sharing any any of those, let's let's take our fundraising. We raised money from nine investors, but we had much more discussions with many other investors that you know decided not to invest. And uh, I want to encourage all the founders out there and all the people that are trying to work on their ideas to understand that behind every success, there are probably m- m- many more failures that reinforced and allowed that success to happen. Because um, again, if you take failure as uh, lessons and learnings, that will just help you improve. And constant improvement definitely leads to success in the end. How many investors did you have to like talk to before getting the final nine investments? I think that we talked with more than 50 investors yeah. to get nine to invest. And, uh, you know, that's uh, sometimes those n- numbers are like standard. Sometimes you need more to improve upon. I would say that it's just about being persistent. It's just about trusting in yourself and being open to change and evolve. Yeah, I love the persistence part because like same thing for me when I'm trying to get guests onto the podcast, a lot of times they would just ignore me or say no. Um, So definitely like keep on trying and something will work out. (laughs) I just want to add to that, Rick. Uh, I think that uh, one, one smart person said that the environment is really neutral. So we shouldn't uh, take success as any uh, success or failure as anything personal. Like the environment is is neutral, and we just need to be persistent and find ways how to achieve goals that we want. So uh, I definitely encourage everyone to trust in yourself, like you do with your podcast, and keep trying. And uh, you know the results will be coming in for sure. Yeah. And Darko, what do you think the future is like? Like, would it be, you know, we have a vending machine, we press a button, and then behind the scene, you know, meat is made from the air, honey is made without bees, milk without cows, and then suddenly we have a brunch that's, you know, ready using like science and magic. Like, is that what it's going to look like in the future? Uh, that's an amazing question, Rick. The future is definitely exciting. And I don't necessarily know what will be the forms of delivery of the food. Mm-hmm. Should it be like a, a pill that would satisfy all the uh, calories that you need to take for a day. But what I know for certain is that the future of food industry lies in producing food without a negative impact on our environment. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we will get there in producing all of our favorite products without animals, without the negative impact on the environment. And that's the most important thing. And I'm really happy to say I think it's really important that we appreciate the state of evolution where humankind reached, that we can, that we have the power to deliver an amazing and delicious products and nutritious products that we want to consume just without a negative impact and without the suffering of animals. Yeah, that's awesome. And do you have any advice for someone like me who is still a student, uh, but I'm interested in entrepreneurship and might want to start something of my own in the future? Find your own journey. And when I say this, um, I, I, this is a message to all of you out there who want to launch something in the food industry. Find something that would be your own journey. Um, try to think about the products and the food that make you really passionate about. There are many food products that I really love, but nothing is uh, making me as passionate as honey is. You know, I love vegan cheese. I love vegan meat. I love vegan eggs and things like that. But all of those products wouldn't make me uh, to become as passionate as I am for honey. So try to find your personal connection with something that you really care about. Try finding your why. Think about uh, the connection with certain products that you have that go as back as your early childhood because uh, the journey sometimes will be really hard. And if you're not connected purely with something that is your core mission, then it will be more challenging for you to keep on, to keep on going, to keep on moving. But when you're really connected with your journey, when you really find what is it that makes you wake up easily uh, early in the morning and stay awake late night, that's the product that you should go after. 
Yeah, definitely. Like, I think that's a common theme I've been hearing from a lot of these entrepreneurs. Basically, find what you're really passionate about because entrepreneurship is hard. You will fail if you don't like what you're doing. So I love that.、Um, so, Doctor, I prepared a quick game. Underrated, overrated. The first one, Silicon Valley. Overrated. Ethereum. Underrated. Do you own any or?、Uh, not Ethereum specifically, but I plan to do. What What do you own? Like Bitcoin or? Bitcoin. Got it. Awesome. Next one, LinkedIn.、Uh, underrated. The B movie.、Uh, the cartoon. Yeah. Underrated. Everybody should be watching that movie. It's an amazing movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that as well.、Uh, so this is the last question,、um, which is, what is the best advice you ever received? When, when the times are really tough, stay true to yourself.、Mm. It's easy. It's it's really easy for me to say that as an advice, but、uh, I received this advice from a couple of people. And not necessarily from industry, rather like very like smart people,、uh, smart and 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 wise. Stay true to yourself, meaning that trust that you will be able to、um, to manage everything that comes to you. Sometimes that what is coming is really hard, and it will pin you down, and you will feel really powerless. But staying true to yourself means. That you'll find way, you'll find way to cope with it, to deal with it, and you'll find way to stay on top of it and succeed. I love that. So find something we're passionate about, and then stay true to ourselves.、Uh, that's, that's awesome.、Um, so this is it for the interview. Thank you so much for coming on again, and I wish you and Melly Bao the best of luck. Thanks for having me, Rick. And I love your questions. I hope you enjoyed this episode. My main takeaways from chatting with Darko are to stay true to yourself, to find your own journey, and also to realize that the environment is neutral. So don't take successes and failures personally. Now I'll be discussing these three takeaways in more detail in a separate episode after this one is published. So be sure to stay tuned on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. With that, let's grow our seed of innovation and creativity together. And I'll see you next time.